System identification is the process of using data rather than physics to develop a model of a dynamic system. We are trying to identify the underlying dynamics that produce the observed system behavior. And in this series, we're going to look at different ways we can approach system identification for linear systems, nonlinear systems, and for online and recursive system identification. But before we get into all of those specifics, in this video, let's just take a step back and figure out more generally what system identification is and where it fits in the bigger picture. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. Let's start by talking a little bit about models. In general, a model is a simplified representation of the real system. And the idea is that you develop something that mimics the essential features of the system you're interested in, and then leaves out everything else. And having a simplified representation has a lot of benefits. For example, if you're designing a controller, we have lots of tools available that can help us find the optimal solution if we have a mathematical representation of the system, especially a linear representation. We can also combine the predictions from simple models with sensor measurements to improve state estimation or to predict when maintenance needs to occur. And we can use models to perform formal analysis in order to guarantee performance or safety. We can use models to replace physical systems and environments in testing by simulating them. And we can reduce those models to even more simplified versions to speed up those simulations. And there are many other uses as well. It's all part of the larger concept of model-based design. And models come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but no matter what, in order to be useful, a model should adequately capture the essential features of the system. Now, what is essential? Well, that depends on what you are developing your model for, and it requires some amount of understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. For example, if you want to understand how much fuel is needed for a particular rocket launch, then the model of the rocket should take into account the dynamics that play a significant part in determining this. These are things like the mass, the thrust, the aerodynamics, the atmosphere and gravity, and information about the trajectory. You probably don't need to model things like vibration through the internal structure. It's not essential for that question. However, vibrations do play an important role in material fatigue, or sensor disturbances, or ride quality. And so if your goal is to understand those things, then your model should include those dynamics. All right, so what is represented in a model is situation dependent. But how do we represent that information? That's the next question. And in general, a model is composed of two main parts. There is the structure, and there are the parameters. And let me explain this with an example. Let's take this physical system with a mass, two pulleys, and a spring. And I want a model that can predict the motion of the mass given an input force. And I could represent this system with this model, which is an ordinary differential equation where F is the input force and X1 is the output. This model has a structure, which is made up of these operators, and it has parameters, which are the values that populate this structure. And in this case, they are the physical quantities of mass, radius, inertia, and spring constant. And this is a linear model, so it's not going to capture the nonlinear dynamics, and it doesn't capture other things like disturbances and whatnot. But it has the essential dynamics that I need to predict the general motion of the mass to some level of accuracy. Now, there is more than one way to structure a model. For example, I could choose to model this system with a slightly different differential equation. Here, if I don't know the specific physical parameters, I could choose a more general second order differential equation with the parameters A, B, C, and D. And even though these two models can represent the exact same dynamics, they are represented slightly differently. Now, we're not limited to just differential equations. We could choose any number of other structures, like process models with time delay, or non-parametric models like frequency response models, or even something more abstract, like neural networks, and so on. But no matter what the structure is, the model would still have to capture the essential underlying dynamics of the real system in order to be useful. So how do we create a model that can capture those dynamics? Well, that depends on how much you know about your real system. 
If you know all of the essential features of your system and how they contribute to its dynamic behavior, then you can take a white box approach to creating a model. That is, since you know all of the dynamics, you can write the model directly using first principles and physics. Basically, you're able to look into the box that represents the system and see everything. In this case, you're probably more likely to write out differential equations than, say, a neural network, since they more closely represent the way people think about the dynamics of physical systems. And this is essentially what was done to develop this second-order differential equation for the mass and pulley system. I knew there were two pulleys, a mass and a spring, and I knew how they all interacted, so I could write the equations of motion. However, another white box method would be to use this knowledge of the system to model each of these components not as differential equations directly, but with a physical modeling program, like Simscape. But however you do it, the key to the white box method is that you have access to and an understanding of the essential dynamics of your system. On the opposite side of the spectrum is the black box method. This is where you have no idea what's inside the box because you can't see into it, and therefore you can't use first principles or physical modeling programs to capture the essential dynamics. You might not even know what the essential dynamics are. So how can we get something out of this level of understanding where we can't write the equations directly? Well, this is where system identification comes into play. At a high level, it works like this. Let's say we have a system with unknown dynamics. It's a black box, and we want to build a model of it so we can make some kind of prediction of how this system will behave in the future. And here's a way to approach this problem. We can excite the system with input signals, which in turn affect the output. So there is some relationship between the input and the output data. And assuming we were able to excite all of the essential dynamics of this system, we could use that data to learn a mathematical model that mimics the observed relationship. To do this, we have to choose a model structure that we think can represent the behavior we see, and then we have to fit that model to the data by selecting the best parameters. Now, as a quick side note here, there's an important difference between modeling the system dynamics and just doing curve fitting. And to highlight that difference, let's use this data to predict what the system output will be in the future. And one way to do this is to fit a curve to the output data and extrapolate that curve out into the future. For this example, the output data looks like an exponential that asymptotically approaches some value. So we could pick the structure of the curve equation to be something like this, and then fit it to the data by adjusting the parameters. Now, this curve will allow us to predict future values, and it does so with an equation that has a structure and parameters, just like we talked about. However, curve fitting doesn't describe the underlying mechanisms that created the data. It just describes the particular sequence of data. For example, a curve fit won't give us any prediction of what the output would be if we initialize the system in a different state, or if we give it different input signals altogether. But with system identification, we are taking advantage of the correlation between the points in the data to fit a dynamic model to it. That is, with dynamic systems, the output at time t is a function of the inputs plus previous system values. And so we can build a model whose output isn't just a function of time, but is in some way also a function of the previous system values. In this case, we could choose a first order differential equation for the structure of the model and then choose parameters a and b to fit it to the data. Now, the solution to this equation is the exponential we found earlier, so they produce the same curve, but now we have a model that we can use to predict what the data would look like from different starting conditions and with different inputs, which is a lot more powerful than just curve fitting. So if you take anything away from this video, it should be that with system identification, we can walk away with a better understanding of the function itself, the model of the system, and not just its results. Let me show you what this could look like in a really simple case. In this Simulink model, I have a system with unknown dynamics, and I wanna to try to find another model that can capture the essential dynamics in a way that can be used for prediction. Again, I can excite it with, say, a step input, and then record the response. 
So given this particular input, the system produces this output. Now I want to fit a model to this data. And since it's a single input, single output system, and it doesn't look like there's much delay in the system, I'm going to just choose a transfer function as the structure. Now, as far as how many poles and zeros to use, well, I can get a first guess of it by looking at the data. Since there's a slight overshoot, I know that this is at least a second order system. And since the steady state error is about zero, then the zeroth order terms will be equal. So I'm going to try to fit this transfer function with two poles and no zeros. So G of S is my candidate model, and the tunable parameters are the damping ratio zeta and natural frequency omega. And let me just choose some random values, and then I can simulate the response to the same step input. Now, clearly, this behavior of the model doesn't match the real system at all. But at this point, I can tune the parameters by manually moving the damping ratio until the overshoot is about the same. And then I can adjust the natural frequency until the curve is about as close as I can get it. There we go, something like that. Now, I was able to tune this model by hand because it was so simple, but in most cases, there's multiple inputs and multiple outputs, and there's just lots of tunable parameters. So it makes more sense to fit the model with some kind of numerical method that's adjusting the parameters automatically to minimize a cost function. And just to show you what this looks like, let me identify this really simple system with the transfer function estimator function in MATLAB, and that's part of the system identification toolbox. I've previously saved off the step input and step response of the real system, both at 10 millisecond sample times, and now I can use that data to fit to a transfer function with two poles and no zeros, just like we had before. And this is what it came up with. And you can see it's actually pretty close to what I did by hand, so that wasn't too bad. But let me just adjust this real quick anyway so that it's closer. All right, so this is a more optimal fit of this model. But something to note about this model is that I don't actually know if it represents the real dynamics of the system. All I know is that for this particular input, the output behaves the same. The real test is if the behavior still matches, even under a different set of inputs, which again is one of the benefits of a dynamic model over a simple curve fit. All right, so to show this, let me replace the step input with this new signal, which itself is just a series of different step inputs. And if I run that through the real system and through the model, we can see the result. And they match pretty well, but you can see that it's not perfect. So the real dynamics are more complex than a simple second order system. However, again, we're not trying to make a perfect model. We're just trying to model the essential dynamics. And if I'm happy with this amount of error, then the second order transfer function is still a good model. And if I'm not okay with this error, then I'd go back and maybe increase the model order or maybe change the model structure altogether. Now, I made that sound kind of easy, but there are a ton of different model structures to choose from. For example, even within transfer functions, we can choose any number of poles and any number of zeros, and we can choose whether it's a continuous or discrete function. Or if we're trying to fit a model to vibration data, we might choose a frequency response model, and then we have to decide on the size of the parameters for it. Or we might develop a nonlinear model, like a nonlinear ARX model or a Hammerstein Wiener model, which combine a linear and nonlinear component in either parallel or series. Or you may choose some other nonlinear representation, like a neural network, as well as many others. And with a purely black box method, you might not have any information about your system ahead of time, so how could you possibly choose the best model structure? Well, one approach is to just fit multiple models of various sizes to your data and then check each of those against a new set of data to see which best suits your needs. In this way, it's kind of a trial and error approach to finding a model structure. However, often you're not approaching the system completely blind. You have some amount of knowledge that you can use to help you choose the right structure and develop the model. For example, if I knew that this was my system, I could figure out ahead of time that a second order model would be sufficient to capture the essential dynamics. And then I could use data and system identification to estimate the parameters of this model. Or I could even take it a step further and derive the differential equations with physical parameters, then fill in the values that I could easily measure, 
and then estimate the other parameters with data and system identification. This is called a gray box method because it's a combination of using your detailed knowledge of the physics of the system to set up the initial problem and then using data to learn the remaining portion of the model structure or parameter set. And this is the general idea behind all system identification methods. If you have access to good input-output data that captures the behavior of the essential dynamics of your system, you can fit a model of your choice to that data using a numerical estimation technique. And building a model from data like this is a counterpart to deriving a model through first principles. Although the two can be combined to give you the flexibility of picking some model parameters and the power to learn the others. All right, that's where I'm going to leave this video. For the rest of this series, we're going to expand on each of these ideas. So hopefully they'll make more sense and we'll also show them in action with more practical examples. So if you don't wanna miss that or any other Tech Talk video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.